Now, obviously, uh, a number of you have noticed the increasingly large role of Kieran McKenna through today's conference, and many of you be aware of his push to topple me as MC through lunch. Happily, I've, I've had the numbers to, to narrowly hang on at the moment, so thank you uh, for that. Um, pretty sure if the conference was going into a third day, I wouldn't be as confident that he, he might have the numbers to roll me by then. Um, but for now, I remain as MC of this wonderful conference. The last afternoon, it'll end in a fantastic way. We're uh, going to begin with the session, Today's Foundations for Tomorrow's Payments, Real-Time Payment Initiatives, Creating Better Customer Services. Uh, it's about all the development uh, of, of Pay2, which is the next generation, really, of NPP. Uh, Nathan Churchwood, Head of Product Emerging Services at Cuskill, will give a presentation. Then there'll be a panel discussion that he will facilitate, unless, obviously, Kieran comes on and reckons he should do it. Um, uh, Nathan, who you met yesterday, is uh, doing a lot of wonderful work at, at Cuskill, leading the MPP and CDR at a product devel development level, as well as industry representation and client engagement. When he gets to the panel, it will be uh, Christian Westerland Wingstrom, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Munova, and more uh, admirably even than that, a man described yesterday by, I can't remember who by, but as the best dressed man in payments. I mean, obviously a s significant qualifier there, best dressed man in payments, um, but nonetheless a, uh, an excellent title. Uh, also on the panel will be Marnie Ryan from NPPA and Luke Fawcett, GM um, for Go Cardless. So a great panel. Let's, um, let's kick it off with some opening remarks from Nathan. Please make him welcome. <laughs> Again, I personally think it should be you, <laughs> best dressed man in payments. No offence, but that I'll is a good I'll take banking, answer. I'll give payments to Christian. How about that? <laughs> so thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. And I guess what we're going to cover over the next uh, hour is looking at there's so much development and construction. You've seen that theme coming a lot about the things that are being built. And we're building, as James said, the next generation. We're building on a foundation that we've had with NPP, and we're taking that forward for even more level of integration and capability that will come with Pay2. We'll also then touch on what's going to come next, because that construction doesn't stop. Payments continue to evolve. The way that we're working and the way that we're living the way that payments are embedded more and more into all of those aspects means that there will continue to be the evolution. So we'll talk a little bit more as well about how that's going to look. And to help me with that, as we said, Marnie is good joining us. Marnie's uh, one of our key contacts at MPPA, and for many of you, your teams will also be helping, uh, working with Marnie and her team on the rollout of, of Pay2. Very honoured that uh, both Christian, as a winner, not just best dressed, but also that uh, founding the FinTech Organisation of the Year at the recent Finneys. And Luke, also a winner at the Finneys. So congratulations as Excellent in Payments winner. So we're really pleased to have partners in payments that are leading the market and very much are helping to shape what the future of payments looks like. But first I'd like to introduce you to Pay2. You've heard that a number of times over the last two days. Many of you are also involved in investments in building capability, both for your business customers and your retail customers, as either a payer or initiator of what Pay2 looks like as well. So it is one of the most significant investments that we've made in the last five years. It does set us up for the next five, 10 plus years as well. But from a customer perspective, what does it mean? We'll start with a video that really does look at, for a customer, whether it, most of it are from your consumers or your retail customers, what are they going to experience with Pay2? And why should they care? What's going to be different for them? So let's have a look at what a customer will experience with the rollout of Pay2 into your bank accounts or for your merchants of what their customers will experience when they're making payments to them.
Introducing Pay2. With Pay2, you can use your bank account to pay your way. Pay directly from your bank account for recurring bills, subscriptions and memberships. With Pay2, you can pay directly from your bank account for things that previously needed a card, like for online shopping or when using apps like food delivery or rideshare. You can see and manage these payments within your existing internet or mobile banking. Using Pay2 is easy. Set up a Pay2 agreement with your BSB and account number, or better still, your Pay ID. Then approve the agreement in your existing internet or mobile banking app, making it a safe way to pay. You can manage all your Pay2 agreements in one secure place. You'll be able to see when a payment is due, the amount and who the payment is for. You'll soon start to see Pay2 as an option for all kinds of payments, whether it's for your electricity bill, flight, TV subscription, or funding your digital wallet. Choose Pay2 and take the hassle out of payments. Find out more from your financial institution or visit pay2.com.au. So powerful bank account payments and the features and benefits of those payments come because of the integration and having a validation right through the whole process. Very different to the way that uh, direct debit and other bank account payments happen now. And in some ways, even more advanced than card payments. And those advancements in account to account payments are brought about by a number of benef uh, benefits and integrations that are happening across the whole ecosystem. So these seamless, digitized and efficient processes, which include many of the features that are first in account-based payments, are all going to be part of the solutions that many of you are delivering. They're going to be part of that future that enables us to start transacting in all of these applications that we've been hearing about over the last two days in the new ways of working. A customer's account and the authorization will then be validated in real time. You can see some of the sample screens that will happen and be delivered through internet banking. And it's some of that standardization that we've all been working on together that will help customers to understand and be able to talk amongst themselves. It's a learning we've had from some of the early days of NPP that we do need to have a lot more standards and, syn and synchronization between what different banks deliver to their customers. So if the customer provides a pay ID, the initiator even has a benefit of being able to confirm the details of who they're going to receive the payment from. And again, in this in day and age where we want a lot more visibility, we've talked about uh, yesterday with uh, crypto, that seeing the end details of the payer and the receiver is much more important than in uh, value than it ever was in the past. Pay ID is now doing that in payments from accounts. We're also going to be seeing that now in payments to accounts through Pay2. And once the payments agreement's in place, the initiation is submitted and the funds can be checked and available in real time. Again, very different to the way that people experience an account for a payment from their account now, if it's by direct debit, where it, they don't know for a number of days whether it has been successful. That will open up a whole lot of new use cases that we'll start to talk about over the next 15 minutes or so. Now the initiator then will receive that confirmation that the payment has happened. Again, experiences that they haven't had in the past when payments have been wanted to be made directly from accounts. One of the reasons you'll start to hear account-to-account uh, -account payments starting to flow through and be talked about a lot more as a serious alternative and a serious benefit to customers and the, account, and the value they get from their bank account. That payment agreement is authorised and stored centrally, and that means that can also be portable. And while on day one, that won't be a feature, it's part of that evolution that we're now committing to, to keep rolling out capability over the next few years. So within 12 months of going live, once there are enough pay to agreements in the market that people understand, the next phase of the rollout will happen where they can move those between their accounts. Just like they can move their pay ID now, they'll be able to move their payment agreements. So as many of you are challenger banks, you're acquiring new customers all the time, those payment agreements they've established at their existing bank can also move over just like their pay ID can now. And then because those agreements are active, they're able to be seen in their online banking, 
The next uh, feature that is going to be valued by customers, but also valued by merchants, because if a customer does want to pause, cancel, or defer their agreement, there'll be a notification provided. So I'll be able to go into my bank app, I'll be able to see the payment agreements I've got. How many of us have no idea the direct debits. We talked yesterday about subscriptions and the number, number of subscriptions that we often have. And I, I forget the number, but it was, I think it was 20 something. I think I've probably got 40. I have no idea where they are until they come through. So with those ones that I signed a pay to agreement, I'll see those in my mobile banking app. If I did want to make a change to it, want to pause to it, I can hold that in the app and my service provider or the, uh, the, the company that I've signed that, I guess not signed, but authorised that uh, pay to agreement with will know immediately that's happened. They'll be able to proactively uh, contact me to set up alternative payment arrangements. Again, just takes a lot of friction out of the process. So pay to has that security of being a credit payment as well. It's being, it's, I guess, as it says on the tin, it's a pay to. It's paying from my account to somebody else with my authority and set up with that third party. So that takes away some of the inefficiencies of current payments. If I want to put in details and send a payment to a business, most of them don't want that. Now, we've got uh, clients that have created some great solutions around getting and dealing with uh, that issue of unidentified payments. But generally in the market, a, a payment that is sent to a business's bank account is generally a challenge to reconcile. What Pay2 does is because it's initiated from the business and then um, processed back to me from the customer's account, I can pre-populate all of the reconciliation information. So it's again going to ensure that if I make a payment to somebody else, uh, they'll be able to identify that much more easily than they would in the past if I just randomly, or not randomly, purposely, but without, con without structure, send the payment to them. So in that age where everything expected to be real time, what are some of the use cases? What are the solutions that some of our clients are bringing to market to ensure that pay two becomes a really common, well-known, but also fast growing solution? We've seen that it'll be embedded into business applications, which is very different from taking NPP to that next step. At the moment, it's embedded into your banking apps, but it becomes very a bank-centric, bank-to-bank -bank payment. Really now, it's going to be me as a customer interacting with those parties that I trust to ensure that I can give them the authority to initiate payments on my account based on the terms that we agree. So the benefit of payment initiation can extend to all of these uh, use, use cases around subscriptions we've talked about, around billing. So subscriptions, whether it be for the same amount every month, every week, potentially every day, depending on the use case, or it could be initiated based on an action that I take. And that could be multiple times a day. That could be at the end of a billing cycle. So we're going to see the way that we work, the way that we live, payments will be embedded into all of those applications and platforms that help us every day to be who we are, service the customers we want to service, buy and sell what we want to do. Then there'll be new use cases that currently are not common for account-based payments. They either carry more risk or they have uh, larger values that a lot more businesses and B2B payments might want to uh, look at. We can see some of the early use cases with uh, e-commerce sites and digital wallets that are looking to have an account-based payment that takes away some of the frictions that I've talked about that they would get if they were just receiving unmatched credits to have that integration. So again, yesterday we heard about how digital wallets are becoming very, very important. The ability to fund that digital wallet directly from your account by having a pay-to agreement and then payment initiation will become a real feature of the growth and the next step of iteration. Bianca talked about uh, India and the way that their uh, super apps work. Effectively, if we think about the way those super apps are funded and payments are initiated from those apps for services, 
the flows are very similar to pay to, where it actually sends a payment from my account to the other party that is uh, part of that app-based ecosystem. For banks, when you open a new customer account, you could include a pay to agreement as part of your account opening process. It means that before you, your new customer even completes that very first interaction and journey with you, you've actually created an arrangement with them to have the first deposit to their account included as part of that account opening experience. Now, that's probably not just a valuable experience for a bank, but also for a valuable experience for any organization that is providing a financial service and wants to ensure that they can create the uh, financial transaction as part of the first opening experience. At the moment, you open an account and you hope that the customer then funds it. Some of the work we've been doing uh, with Visa and others is that we see that the faster that a customer has money in their account and starts to use it, the more engaged and the, uh, the, the longer their customer life, the more valuable their customer lifetime value will be. And the savings plans. You could have savings plans based on different activities and automatically moving funds into that account because you've got that pay to agreement in place. So as rates increase and we start to then uh, really start to look again at what the uh, competitive nature of savings, whether it be term deposit or uh, high interest uh, accounts with bonus savers, you can again integrate pay to into the customer experiences and the banking experiences that you're creating. I've also got up on there a case of bulk payments and salaries. And you're like, what, what is, how, how does that work? How does a pay to agreement help a, a salary? So if you think about now at the moment, businesses that they're using a salary platform and they don't want to have a file that they transfer down from the bank, they want to have the salary platform manage it all for them, they'll have to move money in and pre-fund the, uh, the service provider. Or alternatively, they will be stuck with having to download the file and then upload it back to the bank because the bank has to be the one that uh, debits their account to process the salaries. What we'll start to see now is that that funding of that transaction to fund the disbursement of salaries or to fund the disbursement of uh, creditor payments will now be able to be done with pay to because you'll transfer from the bank to the platform that's providing the services to do the salaries and then they'll do a disbursement with a normal MPP payment. Alternatively, for very small businesses, they might use the solution where it is a pure account to account. So for their five staff, it moves it from their account at bank A to each of their staff members' account at bank B, so there's five transactions. And it means that they can very simply integrate directly into their payroll system. We'll see a number of different use cases like that playing out. So it's not an exhaustive list though. There's lots of use cases. As we've had working groups with clients, we've sat down and talked to them, the opportunities are endless. And it's all about integrating those platforms software, retail experiences, but also financial services experiences into account payments that then start to fund and are triggered directly from the customer's account, but also giving that control that customers can see from their bank app what they've got in the market. It really start to does bring back their account and their bank to the one that is enabling them to do a lot. So even if you're not delivering the end experience, it can be very obvious that you as the banker are enabling your customer to access these services. So the solutions that we've built to enable our clients to access them have been looking at all the, the different categories, all the different capabilities that many Cuscal clients have. We've had clients that have been payment service providers, We've got clients that have been banks. So we knew that we needed to service both parts of, of that client base. We knew we needed to provide both the services to payers as well as the services to initiators. And what we're really proud of is that we've got a group of our clients that are now live and in, uh, ready to go, They're finalizing testing, and we'll very shortly see customers able to make and receive uh, pay to payments uh, using some of these customers. So congratulations to uh, some of these early adopters. Great Southern Bank, People's Choice, will be very early adopters and live within their uh, uh, payer services. We've got 
as you pay, easy pay manoeuvre, paper plane and Xi, again, in that final stage of testing that we're going to start seeing the live solutions once Cusco and our clients complete the, uh, the live proving of our systems that are now in production. And then over the next couple of months, we've got 30 more payers and initiators coming to market. So we'll start to see some mass and some scale. We'll have other banks come on as well that are working with uh, with Cusco, but also others that are working are direct participants. So we'll see around 35% of all accounts in Australia reachable by pay to by the end of this year. And then over the next 12 months, that will continue to scale up. So thinking about scale, one of the questions that I often get asked is, well, how many transactions will there be? Where are they going to come from? Is this going to be a replacement of direct entry or is it going to be extra transactions? And if we think about then what we've seen over the last two years, there's been exponential growth in NPP payments at 170% growth um, over, uh, since January 2020. And during that time, definitely we know a lot of those transactions used to be direct entry. But most of those got converted from the pay anyone out of mobile banking and internet banking into NPP before this. So a lot of them have come from new transactions and the way that customers are using their account. So by having those real-time payments, they've started to do more. And that's why we've then seen that uh, direct entry hasn't actually been uh, diminished. There's been new transactions that have come into the market as well because there's much more innovation, there's much more capability. So we've got clients like Xi, and Maneuver and Zepto that are creating solutions that are talk, uh, introducing payments for, for payouts and introducing new credit transactions into the market that is lifting the total volume. And we think this will also then play out as we go into NPP and add pay two, that there'll be a lifting in the total volume. Yes, there will be some substitution, but there'll also be, uh, be growth. We've seen that with the, uh, on the other side, so transactions that are currently debited from customers' accounts as opposed to credited, out of custom, uh, sent from customers' accounts. Again, the same thing. Over the last two and a half years, 32% growth in the total transaction volumes as more platforms are integrating payments into the way that they work. Again, it's a theme you've seen the last couple of days, that payments are central and integrated and embedded in all of these finance and retail and lifestyle experiences. So it's about 10% now, 9% 9 of uh, accounts that are debited from a customer's account that are by direct debit, and the rest of them are by debit card. So with those, those debit transactions, absolutely a target for substitution by pay two. And what that does set up as well then is that we're starting to have the framework and the capabilities that make a migration away from BEX in the future a reality. At the moment, there isn't really an alternative to that bulk and that account debiting process that uh, BEX supports. So what we're do doing now is putting in the foundations that we then start making those decisions about when that migration happens. And we're not the only market that is talking about this growth. Jamie touched on this earlier, that in the UK, we're seeing some exponential growth, 500% over the last year or so, in terms of the volumes of payments that are now being initiated by open banking. And while pay two isn't exactly the same as open banking payments, I actually think in some ways, it's better. So in some ways, the convenience of being able to have your agreement in place and having that payment embedded, automated, triggered without any uh, continual interaction so it becomes seamless, is going to potentially drive faster take up of our solutions than even the UK has seen. It's interesting though that last month that the UK introduced a solution that does look sort of like uh, pay to. It has uh, an open banking consent and once that consent is in place, then there are transactions that could be triggered based on that. At the moment, the use cases are very small, and I'll call on Luke to talk about that a bit later because Go Cardless is using that in the UK and, and what he sees that uh, we, can, we can learn from the UK experience of open banking payments. 
And then we'll watch with interest of, of how these platforms and these global solutions that are starting to integrate into open banking payments in other markets look to say, what do we have for, uh, for pay to here? A number of the inquiries that we get from overseas uh, platforms is because now that they've got the ability to do account-based and account-to-account payments in other markets, they want to be part of what also happens in Australia. So we see that with cards, and I think we'll see the same play out with, with Pay2, that it's moving the, the, uh, the dial away from all transactions happening in one way to having lots of different solutions. But businesses don't want to have to manage all of that, so they'll turn to service providers. And that's one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be supporting that service provider market across the, across the platform in much the same way we've been very supportive of the mutual banking and the alternative and digital banking uh, market for the last uh, 40 years. I'm also confident that there will be a great take up and then customers will embrace it. If we look at the um, situation in the Netherlands, the Netherlands introduced Ideal about 20 years ago, went very slowly, but that's a, a well-established system for account-to-account -account payments, primarily focusing on e-commerce, but it's now it's rolling out to retail and other experiences, and the, uh, the Ideal logo can now be found on all sorts of uh, payment services. And what we're see seeing results there is a huge uh, proportion two-thirds of all uh, e-commerce transactions in the Netherlands are actually paid directly from someone's account using an authorization uh, linked to their bank account. It's not like Pay2 where it's completely seamless. They do still have to authorize each transaction. But uh, we're definitely seeing that those types of solutions do work. And then instant payments overall, the share of digital payments, whether it be uh, an NPP-style NPP credit or a pay to style integrated uh, open banking payment initiation. Whether you're one of the global payment processors like WorldPay or a consultant like McKinsey, the numbers that they're talking about show that this is a significant trend that we're now part of. It's not something that we should watch and see. It's something that we need to be, need to be actually actioning and be a, at the forefront of. I've talked about global markets. The other question then that comes up is, well, if real-time payments are going to be such a huge proportion of the market, and every country is moving towards some form of real-time payment, what would be the integration? Should we be expecting real-time payments that would then go from an account in the UK directly into an account in Australia? Yes, there's, there's probably something like that will happen, but initially, and I think probably at the bulk, it will look at what's happening now in the types of solutions that uh, remitters that are outside the banking system have created really efficient, great customer experiences around what those international remittances are. Whether you think about the, the nature of what WISE are doing, what Xi is doing, and, and what Maneuver does with some of their services, they're all very much more integrated than a traditional bank account-based uh, payment that would come from SWIFT. So I think that the growth is going to come from those services. And what we'll see is that they've created great experiences for me to integrate into, into apps and services and uh, provide capability. But sometimes the slowest part is then the credit that happens at the end once that transaction from the UK hits Australia and then slowly makes, it way, makes its way into my account. So what NPP will be able to do is to take away that last pain point for an industry that's invested in capability that is growing in significance and growing in efficiency to ensure that that payment from their Australian account can go in real time into my Australian account. Generally, remitters have bridged the gap between the, uh, the, the global movement of funds because they happen between their, their accounts and uh, funds that are sourced all over the world. We're not waiting on the old traditional correspondent banking process. And now we're going to see the, uh, the end of that last mile, which is the credit of a domestic payment to settle the outcome of the international payment. 
So I think there's been some concern and some discussions with some of our clients to say, oh, so are we now going to, what does this mean to the services we currently have in place if we've got payment arrangements with uh, third parties that are helping us to do our international payments? Does it mean we now have to deal with international payments? No, it doesn't. What it means is that your customers and you as financial institutions will have the ability to post those transactions in real time because the remitters will be able to use NPP to send those instructions to you. So instead of a manual step to have an RTGS payment that comes and is then manually posted to customers' accounts, or have a direct entry, which is pretty much a blind transaction, you'll have the visibility of the full details, like we talked about in that all the remitters' details and all of the payers' details carried in the transaction so that you have much more security and control, but you also have the benefit that you can post it to their, your customer in real time. From a timing perspective, we'll be able to communicate with you officially uh, what the timing will be, and uh, that was approved by the AP Plus board last week. So by December 2023, NPP participants will be posting those accounts, those payments in real time and identified from institutions, which is uh, generally the most of you in the room, is the timing will be for April 2024. It's definitely something that uh, Cuscal took a, a position on that we felt that with the learnings from Pay2, we need to have that uh, step between when it's delivered by, by Cuscal to give you some time then to roll in and, and, and apply those afterwards. And we think that it's actually a really good outcome that NPP has acknowledged that there actually does need to be a lag time between what we build as a participant and what you take and uh, implement as an identified institution. But generally, it's going to take the same type of processes that you currently do for RTGS and other payments. So the, the overhead will come down to how you then do the AML and the sanction screening on that transaction, and that comes down to your AML and uh, sanctions policies. So we've covered what Pay2 is. We've looked at how account-to-account -account payments are very much a part of the future landscape, and we're going to see a great deal of uh, volume increase and substitution of the types of payments that your customers have now. We're then going to look at how, at the end of next year, we're going to start seeing more, more calculability, so higher value, higher uh, transactions that are coming internationally, and we're going to start to see then that globalization of the way that NPP can be the end credit transaction of a transaction that was initiated on, in offshore. I'm really excited by those prospects, and I'm actually really excited by what we've been able to achieve by enabling bank accounts to be integrated with the experience and the services that all of our customers are going to use every day. I'm proud to be in a room today of people that are being part of creating that, whether you're a payer bank, whether you're an initiator, but the future of those transactions is account-to-account -account payments, and you've all actually been very much part of that journey with us. So I'd now like to expand on the dialogue and include three of those people and uh, from both NPPA and two of our initiators to get their perspective and experiences and then open up to questions and look at what do we think the opportunities are? Where can we actually leverage the, uh, the value for our customers? And where can we leverage the value as financial institutions and payment service providers to get the value from being the early adopters that we all are? So I'd like to welcome Luke, Marnie, Christian. Thanks, Nathan. So thanks for joining us. I think I suppose we should start out with uh, a question for all of you and get different perspectives. And uh, well, why is pay to important for Australian banking? And why will customers care? Christian, so yes, um, It's important to Australian banking because customers will care. <laughs> if they didn't, the first point would be absolutely uh, yes. irrelevant. So um, customers will care because generally, as consumers, we all like 
convenience and we like security. Um, and that goes not just for payments, for probably lots of different things. But generally, that's sort of the killer app. If you find a use case that enhances one or two of those two, then you're probably doing quite well. Pay2 does both. So Pay2, in its simplest possible form, and I've probably it's been um, flogged a few times now, is you know, just think of a real-time direct debit, and, and you've got it. Um, but there are lots more things to it. Um, there is, of course, um, the ability of the additional data, uh, the fact that if you're going to fail and find out in three days, so find out the money wasn't there, you don't wait for three days to find out money wasn't there, you find out immediately, which not just to you as a bank or to us as an initiator is an interesting piece of information to have. It's really good for the customer too, to, to know that, oh, I'm talking to you right now, money's coming out right now, not in three days' time when I might have spent that on something else. Uh, and it has reconciliation impact and lots of other things. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into further, otherwise uh, we can talk for a little while already now, but it will matter to banks because it will matter to all of us. My view is that we will sort of have a moment in the future, which is probably not too far away, where we can't really remember last time we didn't pay to, just like we can't really remember last time we didn't tap and go. Um, it's sort of one of those things that you, you might have swiped at some point because the machine was broken, but it wasn't because you wanted to swipe. You, you want to tap and go. And the same thing will happen with pay to, and there are hundreds of use cases, which, which I'm sure we'll get into. So, Marnie, you've got visibility across a whole range of different uh, banks, yep. and what, what are you hearing from them as to why customers will care? I think it's control. That's the one thing that we've had, even in our, um, you know, in our customer research, um, and what we're hearing back from some of the organisations that we've been talking to as part of our pay to user forum, it's the control that's given to the customer, but that customer isn't just as me as an individual. It's the customer who is a merchant, and the notifications that Pay2 can provide gives you everything that Christian just talked about. You know, it's, it's all about control, and that is one of the key words that we've had again and again, repeated to us again and again. So I guess that links into then financial well-being mm -hmm. and that, uh, looking, after, looking after the customer's interests and not just being a processing, but actually being a, an actual service. Invested in the life cycle of, an, of all of their customers, yeah. Luke, from your perspective, why um, should we care? Um, so I think if we, if we all take a step back, I think Christian gave some, um, some great benefits, but one of the things that we constantly talk to merchants about, and um, one of the pieces of feedback that they get from their end customers is visibility. Um, so the idea of signing up to uh, a subscription or an instalment plan, and as Nathan said, with 40 direct debits in the next phase of our, uh, our marketing campaigns, um, that just purely that visibility is the first step before control becomes the next important step. So visibility of who have I really given access to my bank account to? Um, how much is it for? Is it open? Does it end? Is it on a particular cycle? Um, that sort of visibility helps people understand their cash flow position, the investments that they make, um, you know, what they're going to do with their next paycheck, which in all reality is, is how a lot of people in this country live. So I think that visibility is the thing that rings home for me. Sorry. Okay. So I just think the way we do payments now, while obviously the best we can do, it's a bit like looking at the 1960s car that doesn't have a seat belt in the back seats, and that was deemed to be absolutely fine. Mm. I know I used this analogy earlier today, but... You know, it would seem to be fine because in the back seat you can always keep your arms out. I think, the, <laughs> I think the, the, the speed at which your arms will no longer protect you is seven kilometers an hour. I think we're moving in the, like, we're only ever moving seven kilometers an hour kind of paradigm at the moment. Yep. So as you say, I mean, both the visibility and the control, it will seem absolutely crazy that we didn't have seat belts in the back seat mm -hmm. really quickly. Yep. Clearly coming from a Volvo and not a Commodore like I grew up in. Obviously. <laughs> And then from, from a business perspective, as a payment service provider, I think that uh, the, the models for Maneuver and GoCardless are slightly different, you do, uh, but why is uh, Pay2 important for, let's start with Maneuver. Christian, why is it important for you? And you, you've made a commitment to be a really early adopter. Yes. Why has that been important as well? Um, I think if you're, if you're not early, you don't learn fast. And mm -hmm. if you don't learn fast, then you don't deliver good product. Um, so for us, it was really early to be sort of really important to be early um, because uh, you set a lot of market expectations um, for a wider audience, both your clients and others. Um, but you participate also in creating uh, good practice. Um, 
And we saw it with NPP. So Manuva was really early with real-time transactions, also working very happily with Cascal. Um, and sure, there was, and I'm sure we'll get into this too, lots of service variability. In the beginning, some accounts were accessible by MPP, and lots of them were not. Uh, and even when they said they were, then business accounts still weren't, et cetera. Um, but that didn't hinder us from learning an awful lot and creating a really good, or, um, sorry, a much better product by virtue of just having tried. It's okay. Most, you're allowed, you're allowed to say you've got a really good product. Most, most you, want, you want an affinity. You must have a good product. <laughs> or a really good marketing team. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we... Um, I think the kinds of clients that we service primarily at this point are generally other financial technology companies. Um, and these are companies that are very, very good at giving feedback. So they will tell us, oh my God, you had a semicolon in your code. It should have been a colon. What were you thinking? Um, and, and they give us that feedback quickly. And while they tell us in harsh tones at the first time, three days later, they say, actually, we had the same issue ourselves. So um, enabling that feedback loop to be really early, so by the time maybe uh, slightly later adopters are getting on board, what we have is already something that's been tried and tested. And I mean, no mistake here, the, the fintechs we're servicing are moving enormous amounts of, of money and enormous numbers of, of transactions. So it's not, a, it's not a proof of concept. It's full production, um, but with groups of people who really value the transparency of process and how you get there, not just the outcome. And I guess, so Maneuver is a focus on fintechs and, and platforms and financial yep. technology. Go cardless, your client base is probably a little bit more traditional billers and yep. recurring cycle. Why is pay to important for a business that probably operates quite well on direct debit? Yeah, and that's, and that's one of the main reasons is, um, so I think there's, for Go Cardless, there are three types of customers. And our, and our business is only built on bank account payments. So we don't process cards, we don't process BPAY, we don't process digital wallets. Our, our business has been built to solve a piece of the puzzle that Stripe and others left behind when they focus their business on cards. Um, so we've got three types of customers. We've got customers who are Australian businesses and we feel like we have great responsibility to manage the evolution of how the existing two billion direct debits that happen in, in this country transition over to pay to. So we feel like we're a great sort of platform to help you manage that change, either by your preference as a merchant or your preference based on your payer demand. So that's the first thing. The second thing is pay to, it will be one of nine direct debit schemes or account-based schemes that we support globally. So for a business that's truly global in several countries, if they don't have pay to, then we limit their acquisition strategy, we limit their retention strategy. So it's a really important piece of the puzzle that makes up our overall account to account network. Um, the third um, opportunity is, as Nathan said, these new use cases where, which have never been able to be served by a bank account before. So we think about e-commerce, um, we think about travel, we think about all of those use cases where pa instant payment is required, or as a merchant, you've had so much hesitation because of fraud that it just, it's, it's been that you've preferenced other payment methods. We see that world changing. So I think there's, there's definitely a crossover between those three, but they're the three reasons why we're most excited. And so, Marnie, from your perspective on a different uh, matter, so what are some of the, the you've done research, so you want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the customer research and some of that, uh, I guess, uh, perception that's been coming through in that. Maybe you could also touch on some of the pay ID um, research. research as well. Yeah. It, it would be good to hear. Um, from a pay to perspective, um, we had just done some recent research, actually, where we talked to um, a, a group of about two and a half thousand, so the sample size was quite large, um, and it gave us an opportunity to present the pay to um, functionality, uh, the concept, the offering, um, and of those people that we surveyed, 80% said that they were actually interested in pay to and would actually use it. Um, and it wasn't just that they would use it from a, um, you know, I'll use it once and I'll take that and, and sort of talk about it but not really think about it. It was, I am interested in this and I will actively, actively use this as part of, you know, my banking experience. So that, for one, was, was great. Um, then add that, we added, it was part of a pay ID research um, piece that we did, adding that to pay ID, um, and the combination of the two actually meant that not only did you get confirmation of payee, you actually had the faster, guaranteed faster payment, but then having that with pay too, 
there was just this level of, um, again, control and security that was called out that we didn't expect to see. Um, and that, again, that was around 86% of those that were surveyed actually felt that they would, they would buy in and have pay ID as part of that process as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I guess another piece around learnings and customer experience then is uh, I touched on what's happening in the UK and that uh, UK has got a slightly different but similar yep. uh, mm -hmm. version of uh, open banking style payments. Yep. Luke, can you tell us a little bit about what Go Cardless has learnt from the UK experience and uh, what people from Australia might be able to uh, garner from that as well? Yeah, sure thing. So there, there are two, uh, two different, I suppose, reasons. The, the first is open banking in the UK is, is huge. Um, it's, if you talk to any business um, that's collecting payments, they want to understand um, how they can use open banking, which is at a further step than what we are in terms of bank connectivity and reliability of data, um, to, to be smarter with the way that they take payments or the, the, smarter with the way they make decisions. Um, so the first product we built, um, self-titled Instant Bank Pay. Um, so it essentially uses open banking to validate the customer and push an instant first-time payment. So very similar to what Pay ID push payments is for us, but Pay ID at a scheme level doesn't exist in the UK. So we had to build it ourselves. So I think of open banking on top of a push uh, direct entry payment is the way that it works. So the use cases for that we're seeing already are things like um, so our first customer was um, an ISP, um, they're called Cuckoo. So think of like Belong here where you sign up online and you need an instant payment to confirm that a technician's gonna come out and install your internet at home and you're also gonna get a brand new modem shipped to your home. If that was purely direct debit, they would wanna wait up to three days for that payment to clear before you could even have a conversation about booking someone in to come to the home to get your internet up and running. So the speed of service is greatly impacted by those experiences. Um, the second thing is um, VRP, which is variable recurring payments. Um, and I'll agree with Nathan, it's not as good as pay to. Um, the reason for that is it's not regulated. So, it's, so there's, no, there's no one forcing the market's hand and pulling all of this together to make, to make that happen at scale. Uh, so we were lucky to process the first VRP payment in the UK. Um, and it's for a similar version of a business like Acorns or Raisies here. Uh, so it's Plum and Moneybox in the UK, which is all about sweeping money from one account to another. So like it's a, like a savings tool. So we're seeing those really early adopters um, grasp these tools um, and almost create products off the, off the back of them. So in some cases, it's about solving a problem that I've already got today. But for a lot of cases, it's okay, this is coming. Even even in its infancy, what product can I build on top that adds value to either stickiness or acquisition when it comes to my customers. So um, we're seeing those two products coupled with traditional direct debit as sort of like the holy grail of accepting payments via a bank account. Thank you. So I'd like to open up to the floor and uh, whether, whether you're a, a payer or an initiator or a casual observer, although I'm not sure there's too many casual observers in terms of payments in this room, um, you're, everyone's got very much a vested interest. What is the other burning questions for you? I'm going to stand up. Eric. It's on. Just, yeah, just closer to you. It's not working. Oh, there we go. Um, it's, it sounds fantastic, and it sounds like there's a lot of good opportunities. It sounds like it makes it really easy for a customer to authorize a payment to, some, to someone else. Um, one of my thoughts is, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so, so you haven't talked about fraud, um, errors, um, failed payments, like all of the things that can go wrong in the world, and particularly uh, particularly the fraudulent ones, how are we, or I guess, what is the thought around protecting us from those kinds of things? So the level of fraud in an account-based payment that is authorised by the customer by nature is, is lower. We, we saw that uh, generally in NPP we've got a very different uh, fraud profile to a card payment where someone pulls money from an account, and if we think about direct debit, there's an assumption that the customer has given 
authority for the funds to be pulled. So inherently, pay to has been designed to give a lot more protection up front by having an active authorization and all of the messaging and the detail of the payment, including who's processing the payment, but also who the payment is for, is provided in that front screen that the customer authorizes. So again, coming back to the point that Marnie made about control, it's not just about control, it's also about visibility, authorization, and security. Then, in the same way you've got all of your uh, online investigation messages for NPP now, that's extended to pay to both for the mandates as well as the payments. So you've got a much uh, greater level of interaction and speed, of speed to action, those outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree that pay to is designed um, in a way that makes some of our most common fraud concerns just distinctly less um, significant uh, and, and relevant. It doesn't mean that something will never go wrong. Of course, something will go wrong. Um, but if we're talking about cards, generally it's someone has written down someone else's car details or they've stolen a card or they've taken a picture of someone's card and, and that's what they then use for some online banking, so e-commerce or similar things. That, that becomes much, much harder if you have to authorize inside your own bank app. Now, of course, someone could have um, taken over your, your bank account, but then you're probably struggling with lots of different things, not just a pay to transaction. Um, it it reminds me, uh, I have a good friend who's working for an e-scooter company, and they were asked by some government where they're, they're working with to make sure that you couldn't possibly put an e-scooter on a pavement. Um, so they had to map the, the city extremely well and then make sure by GPS that the e-scooter never left the, the street and it went onto the pavement. Uh, and then it just stopped working. Um, so it sort of enhanced security feature. The interesting thing to me there was that just like here, um, we asked this question about e-scooter or the pay to, um, but the fact is a car can drive up on a payment any time, and currently we're, we're stuck with cars, um, you know, whether it's direct debits or, or cards or lots of other things. So it's an inherently safer, more secure, uh, and, and just higher control environment. Uh, again, coming back to a strange number of car analogies here. Uh, yeah. my, my seat belts, um, I think we'll, this will look like uh, cowboy land compared to pay to in, in not too long. Yeah. And I will just add to that, Nathan, um, from an NPP, NPPA perspective, um, you know, we have a number of controls that we put in place and there's a number of things that we've worked on in terms of risks and control, um, our fraud framework that relates to pay to, and we've been working on that probably now for three and a half years, I would say. Um, and that has involved not only participant engagement, but also, you know, initiator engagement as well in terms of feedback on scenarios and playing those out. Again, that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect, but it means that operationally, we're ready to review, support, analyze that over the upcoming months. Um, and as pay two goes live, the other thing that we've sort of really invested in is the operations notifications and making sure that as teams are aware of issues, we're actually monitoring that as well. So our support network that we provide as part of NPP essentially allows you to get visibility of how all these things are working and we'll be transparent around that. Yeah. Can I, do you mind if I touch, so yeah. I could talk about fraud all day as well, but um, I think, is Eric, touch on probably the thing that causes the most amount of pain um, for a business with recurring revenue and that's success. So one of the things that, um, so the, the business models and the businesses that have shown the earliest um, eagerness to accept pay to are those businesses which have a problem with either first time successful payment of a recurring payment um, or direct debit or cards have some form of limitation to how they retry a failed payment after that first time. So through the pay to flow, one of the challenges with direct debit today is you can you know, take the BSB and bank account number, but as a merchant, you've got to cross your fingers and your toes that that's been entered correctly and that first time payment is successful. Once you get the first time success, you're a higher probability of that customer having a longer lifetime value. So pay to allows that first time payment success based off simple things like, you know, chubby fingers and keyboard strokes, you know, they, are, they, they, they disappear. Mm. Um, but if you think about some of the other challenges that businesses face is, you know, one of the very large telcos in this country, um, they re if they have a, a customer on automatic credit card payment, they try that automatic credit card payment if it fails eight more times in eight days when it fails. With direct debit, they don't retry it at all because it takes long, so long to get confirmation that the funds aren't there. The reason why, it takes someone 
time to manually download these reports and work out which transactions have failed and which ones haven't. So Pay2 will allow them to hopefully not retry the payment eight times <laughs> in eight days, because that's a bit extreme. But we'll they'll eight times, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but they'll be able to hopefully collect more revenue faster without it having to kick to a very costly debt recovery or collections team to try and chase that failed payment and keep the customer a customer. Uh, on the same train of thought, really, but in the UK recently, authorised payment, push payment fraud has overtaken card fraud. So are the controls better here in Australia or is there a, a wave that it maybe is about to happen? And, and if you comment on that also, for, for whatever the residual level of fraud is, how is liability going to be distributed between the scammer's bank, the scammy's bank, and the poor old scammy? Okay, so I'll, I'll just break that down into the, the two parts. One, that Pay2 puts a layer of security and authorization and vis visibility in front of the push payment that doesn't exist if it's just entered into banking. So definitely it should give a level of security. So if you're then only having a payment that is initiated by a, a platform that you trust and you've got a, a screen that comes up in your banking that says this is where it is going at the moment you don't have that except if it's a pay id based payment which again we've got that for australia which the uk doesn't so we're, our push payments already are one step ahead yep. so we're probably continually to be ahead of the uk in that respect in terms of the the liability model that if there is a, a, a pay to user that is signed up by say Manuva, and the Manuva haven't done their due diligence, identified the customer, done their, uh, effectively onboarded them at the same level of capability as they would a bank account customer, then there is an indemnity that they would have to the, the payer bank. So, but if they've done all of that and it is come down to the, the customer has trusted that party, they've accepted the fact that they're paying XYZ, even though they have no idea who XYZ is, then it, it, it does have a, an aspect of uh, buyer beware. Yep. Marnie, do you want to add anything more on that? Or you I covered it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Like nodding away. <laughs> so, some, of, some of these reasons, so some of these in, um, um, innovations are, are going to alleviate the need for a push. Like I think yeah. uh, Nathan yeah. Christian, you both mentioned that. Um, it's, it's the same as BPay. Like these, the, the faster the, um, the payers banks, so most of you guys, promote the value of visibility, control and security, you can now use Pay2 for a one-time transaction that you used to have to push or you used to have to use via, you know, to via BPay. So um, as soon as you can initiate a one-time pull, it, it creates a whole different opportunity to, to manage the things that you mentioned. Uh, I think just the number yeah. of, oh, sorry, Tristan. Hey everyone, thanks for the chat. <clears throat> um, I know from my own personal banking experience that um, there are a couple of banks who shall remain unnamed for now that actually hold on to an MPP payment for 24 hours um, if it's a first time <clears throat> payment to a new recipient. I was wondering firstly, is there anything in the research that the MPP have done around how that <clears throat> affects conversion numbers for someone becoming a repeat sort of pay ID user. And I guess secondly, from a go cardless perspective, have you thought about how you might factor this into your, your product? I'll yep. answer first. Um, yes, we did include it and there was some um, feedback on the first time holds, is what we sort of call it. Um, and I think over the last two years, maybe even more, there's been active, pers well, persuasion of those um, unnamed banks um, in terms of what they are doing with first time holds. And they've actually brought that down. So they've they have actively opened up accounts and reduced the number and increased the limit on the value of those first time holds. So that has actually changed. And I think within the last three months has come down to a very small number of first time holds that are now in place. Yeah. Uh, short answer, Tristan, yes. Um, we. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, so, yeah, so we, we see, I suppose there's three, the, the, um, Christian and I were talking over lunch about how great it is to be in our industry at this time because so much is changing. And that's a great thing, but the challenge is, particularly for us, 
Um, there's a great benefit to being a global company, but the same thing's happening in a lot of different markets at the moment. And we simply just needed to prioritise where we thought the big bets were first and where they were going to scale the fastest. So the first bet that the business made was open banking. Um, so we've just recently announced our first acquisition um, of a company that specialises in building open banking connectivity. The second thing is pay two. So our exec team and our board believe in this so much that they prioritise pay two over VRP. Um, we've built VRP and then the next thing is getting on the roadmap, um, the idea of being able to solve instant payments in and out uh, via pay ID. It's so probably very worth quickly, because you've got so many pay IDs that you receive funds to, have you seen a reduction over time in first time hold or is it, is it less of an issue perhaps than it used to be? It, it's, it's less of an issue, absolutely. So uh, Maneuver has um, a large bit of the pay IDs in Australia. I think we're 10% or 11% or so of all pay IDs. Um, and that has to do with the size of our, of our good clients. Um, so we've absolutely seen that. I think it's probably worthwhile at this point also bring up explicitly the connection or not between open banking, which we have thrown in a billion times yep. here, and pay two, because they're not actually the same. Yeah. And a lot of people would think that they're distinctly separate. Um, yet we see elsewhere in the UK, has also come up a billion times here, uh, that th they can or could work really well together. And what we think by that is generally that you have CDR, which in, which in Australia is a, a uh, sort of read-only type system, so you can get information, but you can't write. There's no write access, uh, at least not as yet, and we know that it's meant to be coming. What Pay2 does, it, it sort of short circuits the, uh, the initiation part, so the write access on payments specifically, which if you're a payments company, is obviously the most interesting initiating uh, action you, you can do. Um, so I mean, what will be an interesting conversation in its own right is understanding how do we combine those two you know, strong, willful, um, both regulators and organizations behind this into one coherent structure which we can all operate within. Um, and at Manuva, we, we think Pay2 here has an upper hand on initiation because it's actually happening right now. Um, but we'd love to see open banking coming in as a great consent layer for that initiation. Yep. Um, I and mean, I think overall, a lot of the things we're talking about here, and, and it's really good to go into the specifics of the, of the benefits, because you know, without a problem, there is no solution. And without the solution, then what are we talking about? Yep. Um, but um, it's, it's the fact that a lot of the things, we, we're caveating a lot of these things. We talk about real-time payments as opposed to payments, which is a bit like called, talking about color TV as opposed to TV. It should be obvious. Uh, we're talking about bank-to-bank -bank, um, payments, which to me is a bit like when I was a child and I thought about non-cartoon movies. I mean, I, I think that's going to be it. Like, th these are the only transactions, mm -hmm. ultimately, that, that will play a, a significant role. So what's fun here, I think, is that we're talking about the future of payments, but to confuse Pay2 or CDR for that matter, to be the end is a bit like confusing, I don't know, the wedding for, a, for the marriage. It's the beginning, <laughs> right? Yes, it's the right. first day with the rest of your life. Uh, you know, move on from here. <laughs> Definitely we are laying the foundations for what is going to continue to be an evolving landscape. I'd like to thank Christian, Marnie, Luke for your opinions, your insights. I'd like to thank all of you for your investment and your support and getting behind Pay2. It is really exciting to be having a solution that is actually addressing the payment needs of so many of the opportunities that we've covered over the last two days of, uh, of Curious Thinkers. And James, back to you. Nathan, great job. Yeah. Very good. And I thought that last uh, comment by Christian was so apt, real-time payments. Like, as a consumer, someone outside your industry, if I want to buy a lolly, you know, in the old days when you had cash, it's real time, isn't it? You don't get the lolly until you give them the money. And it's always been stunning to me that I can make a payment, whether in the old days by check or a bank transfer, and whoever I transfer it to hasn't got it yet. Like, it just seems weird. You know, if someone gives me a spanner, I've got the spanner. It's not like they put the spanner on the table and say, you can have it in three days. So real time, hopefully that term real time payments will disappear uh, just as the term real-time breathing has disappeared because what other way is there to do it, right? Or else you're dead. Uh, I'm not trying to scare you or anything. It's probably a bad metaphor, the one about dying.